So, I mean, hopefully when I work with people, we, we always, I ask them to prepare for the worst case scenario as well as the best case scenario. So I reckon having a plan B is essential in any business at any stage. Think about what is the worst thing that could happen to your business and what would you do if it happened? Now you might kind of go, but that's negative thinking. That's not going to help me get to where I'm going. We've got the plan to get to where I'm going. We've got the 10-year target. We've got our one-year goals. But we also have to think about what the worst thing is as well. And by having that plan B, it means that when something happens, because it will happen, something will happen to your business at some point. I guarantee it. Um, whether it be a recession that you can't control, whether it be you lose your major client. I mean, I can go through the whole, all the scenarios I've been through. Mm -hmm. Something will happen where you'll suddenly have to change the way that you're doing things. Oh, welcome uh, to the next installment of Better Business, Better Life. We are here with none other than the host, Deborah Chantry Taylor. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Ryan. How are you? <laughs> good. I never do an intro. <laughs> it's, like, it's good. It's good. I think it's really interesting. So Ryan and I just agreed that he's going to overtake my podcast or take over my podcast today, and he's going to be the host. So the floor's yours. Yeah. So so everyone listening now, you, you've missed out. You know, you didn't really get much chance to hear about Deborah and what you've achieved and sort of how you actually help. So I think setting the scene is always useful. Mm -hmm. So. You, you were just playing around with your toys at eight years old and you're like, you know what, EOS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. No, not quite. Well, I did have my first business at 13 years old. Oh, did you? I did, yeah. 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 What was that? Uh, so my parents are not from a particularly wealthy background, and so uh, they were always really good at making sure we had what we needed. But if we wanted anything, we had to raise the money to kind of buy what we wanted rather than what we needed. And so yeah. uh, I have always worked, um, I think, nine years old was my first actual job. But then at 13, I started my own little business at school, and I manufactured, um, <laughs> it sounds really funny right now given the technology, I'm doing technology, but it was little little note pads and writing pads and envelopes, and they had hearts all over them. So I'm a real, I love hearts. I've always loved hearts, and so it was a little little mini kind of writing pads that you could write little messages on, and you put them inside this envelope, and there's a little heart that you sealed it with, and I sold those to other people in my class. Huh. What was your business plan? Did you sit and work it out? Well, did you have a target market? How did you... <laughs> no, I knew none of those things then. All I knew was I needed money and I wanted to make some money. And uh, we did other things too. We did some printed T-shirts. We did some um, yeah. little badges made from like a plasticine type stuff that we'd actually um, make animals and Christmas type things. And so we had lots of different products. And it was just basically anything you could make um, that we could sell. We did. So back in those days, because remember I'm 53 years old, um, printing onto T-shirts was not that that easy you literally had to print stuff out onto an inkjet um like transfer and then you would iron it onto the front of your shirt and then that's how we made the t-shirts so no business plan no target market just knew that we had to sell stuff so we we're always looking for the next thing that would sell um to make some money did you do a funding round like how did you uh, <laughs> yeah you i'm venture nine? capitalist <laughs> no, no. Uh, no i didn't i mean I, I i don't think i knew an awful lot about business back then so i just kind of just winged it and yeah, had some fun with it. But then, of course, my parents, being very traditional, insisted that I actually go and do a science degree and get myself well qualified so I could find myself a good husband. So I then went down the traditional path of becoming a biochemist. <laughs> Housewife. Housewife. Back in the housewife. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that bit. Yeah. That, I mean, that, you can make some next level stuff right at home, couldn't you, with biochemistry? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just, it's funny, I was talking the other day about some of the things we used to do in biochemistry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's not many drugs that we haven't created in a biochemistry lab and had a play with. Wow. Okay. Mm, yeah. On that. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I'm a bit free flowing. The listeners, I'm sure, will be surprised given how structured and, and well set out your podcast is whereas I'm so, just the, Yeah, so it came out, um, it was really interesting because we, we just moved from Greyland just recently, Freeman's Bay and in Greyland Park we'd often be going for a walk and we'd see all these little canisters on the floor, like little, little um, stainless steel metal canisters and Steve said to me, you know, what are they? And there was a little kid picking them up and he's like, bullets, I've got all these bullets. I'm like, no, they're not. I know what they are. And they're basically the, the little canisters that you use um, in the whipped cream dispensers and it's used to whip up the cream and it's basically nitrous oxide and nitrous oxide is laughing gas that they use in um in, in dentists to kind of knock you out mm -hmm. and i remember when i was doing my biochemistry degree we had some experimentations around making things and of course we had access to to nitrous oxide so we actually tried nitrous oxide to see what it would actually do and so it's just funny that he's like how do you know this stuff and it's like oh because you know we, we tried a few things when i was in biochemistry 
that, that's the way how they do it, huh? Yeah. You know, and, some and that's why there's lots of them. Because each one, if you think about it, you can buy, I think we, we, we Googled it afterwards, you can buy 24 nitrous oxide canisters for $24. So a dollar a piece. And one of those will fill a helium balloon. Um, and often people will actually pass a helium balloon around just take a bit. But if you're really heavily into it, you literally take a whole canister as a, as a knock and it knocks you out. Um, and then you eventually come back around again. Do you know the, the latest term for this? No. It's called a nang. Is it? I did yeah. not know that. There you go. See, I'm, I didn't learn that at biochemistry school. <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're a bit on to it sooner because I, I walked in these house parties and there's all these canisters on the ground. I'm yeah, like, what are they doing? Why is whipped cream? Like, yeah. what's that about? <laughs> A kinky sex thing going on. Yeah, whatever, they, whatever. The racks, yeah, I mean, apparently, what what do you feel when you take it? Like you just feel lightheaded and. So you must, or maybe you haven't had it at a dentist. Well, we're back in our day, the dentists use it a lot, and so it literally just knocks you out, um, hmm. and you you go unconscious for a while. I didn't like it at all. I tried it once. I kind of went, this, "What's the point?" Because you don't know what happens to you when you're knocked out. I just feel like you've lost a whole chunk of your life. You don't know how long that was for, uh, but it knocks you out, and then you wake up and you feel kind of lightheaded, and I don't know. It's sort of one of those things that, who knows? Hmm. I mean, but I say, we tried lots of things when we were doing my <laughs> chemistry. So we learned about amyl nitrate. We learned, which I'm assuming you know what that is. Ketamine? No, amyl nitrate is actually a drug that relaxes muscles, um, often used oh. in various uh, sexual practices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but again, we, you know, we could make this stuff in the laboratory. So we would we would try these things. And again, that was another thing I kind of, I don't, I don't get it. In fact, I learned that I don't really get most drugs. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're pretty wide as a general rule of thumb. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't need too much extra help. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wow. Okay. So, you guys, that's my background. I am I am officially a biochemist and food technologist, um, and I know lots about different types of drugs, drugs and chemical reactions in the body. Yeah. Well, what's what's a fun thing someone could do at home? Like, you know, like you put two things together and it makes that salt um, uh, hydro. Um, hydrothermic, I know, hypothermic reaction. It goes really hot and then it blows up and it's, it's a, <laughs> To be honest, I don't, we did everything in the laboratory, so I didn't do anything kind of at home, but you know, the whole Coke thing with the Mentos, that's sort of that um, yeah. effect that you can get. I've not I've actually ever tried it. So, yeah. yeah, if it's not a drug, you don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> I was like, where's this going? Well, and, and interesting, of course, like my, one of my first jobs um, out of uni was actually selling drugs, but not in the sense that you're thinking of legal drugs. I mean, I was a pharmaceutical medical rep for many, many years. I sold oh. antidepressants, antibiotics. Wow. I feel like antidepressants is not a hard sell if you're allowed to prescribe it. I guess you've got to sell it to like... We've got to sell it to the doctor. So if you oh, think about yeah. back in those days, there were many choices about antidepressants. So I was dealing with um, doctors, psychiatrists, um, hospital-based psychiatrists, hospital-based doctors, trying to convince them that the drug that I was pushing was the, the best drug for treating their patients. Wow. Mm. Thought, thoughts on the, medi <laughs> the medical? Is it? Are they just glorified drug dealers? Um, no, I, it was. I, it was fascinating for me because it, it was a really well paid job. Um, it was oh. I'm not particularly regulated over in Australia. So over here, you've got Pharmac that stops you from advertising and from um, you know going and sort of bribing doctors, if you like. We were pretty much bribing doctors by taking them on flash weekends, by giving them gifts, by telling them you know, all the wonderful things about our drug, whilst doing it over a very fancy, expensive meal at a restaurant or taking them out to some long weekend or we had psychiatrists flown in from around the world to talk to them and then they would we would wine and dine them and i've got some stories to tell from those two doctors are not quite as sensible as we'd like to think they are oh no <laughs> I, I find uh, the more serious and structured the occupation the less serious and structured the personal life yes so i remember playing um baseball with an empty bottle of wine and uh, i think we had some tennis balls not quite sure where they came from um and whilst being dressed in our robe in a very very flash hotel you Observatory over in Sydney, um, while having our robes from our room on backwards, dressed like surgeons, because of course when you put a robe on backwards, you're like a surgeon. Yeah, that was a fun night. <laughs> we'll, wow. leave, we'll leave it there. Jeez. Doctors and nurses in real life. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of these um, balls that they go to once they celebrate and finish. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. These were these were obviously, um, well, they were psychiatrists, so they've actually not just a GP. They've been doing many, many years of study. Wow. Very, very smart people, and a lot of fun. I mean, it was it was a fun time. It wasn't a it wasn't actually a really a, a raucous time. It was more of a fun time. Hmm. <laughs> were doctors incentivized to sell more? Not directly. You couldn't actually pay them an amount of money to, to sell, to, to, to prescribe more. But like I said, you, you gave them little gifts. You took them away. You, 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 know, you looked after them. 
So, like, hypothetically speaking, you let's say you don't give a commission, but, like, this one was the top salesperson, and you've got all the numbers you're in. Yep. So oh, I just want to celebrate you. You've just done so well for us. That, like, we got this weekend away. <laughs> yeah. So we, there, was, there was certain rules around it. You couldn't give them physical gifts over a certain value. So in the old days, when I first started, you could give them almost anything. So you could literally kind of go, hey, look, you've been a great prescriber. Um, here's a Ferrari, <laughs> as an example. Not quite. But um, but then they brought in rules, and there was rules on what you couldn't. But we used to give away computers as well. So we used to give away sort of, you know, um, computers for their for their uh, offices but then they brought in rules it was very much around you could only give them a certain amount i think the limit was like 50 dollars. so then we had pens and notepads and little gifts that were all under 50 dollars, so they could actually do that but there was no rules around taking them away as long as it was an educational component so we basically bent the rules to you know we take them to the flashes places my first trip to new zealand was actually a trip to launch a new drug over in um i was living in australia we got flown to new zealand in order to launch this new antidepressant drug and we got put up in the hotel in Christchurch that fell down in the earthquake sadly and it was like I mean it was just such a, a, an amazing experience the amount of money spent on that weekend mm. was almost unlimited we had a 24-7 um, convenience room where you could literally order anything that you wanted during that time at the conference so once the formal conference finished and believe me you and me there were there were dinners there were banquets there were um, we had a whole castle built inside the hotel and we had street performers come along and when you got to your room in the evening, there was actually a dress in your size to be medieval, so you could go downstairs to do a medieval outfit. Um, and in this convenience room, it was like, order whatever you want, it'll basically get paid for by the company. Wow. So it was pretty decadent back in those days. And thank goodness they've changed that, because I think at the time I was young, I was pretty excited by that. It was kind of fun to do all those things. But now I think, yeah, that's probably not a great way to actually be selling product, is it? <laughs> no, no. What, what's the psychiatrist worth? Like, like, let's say they're a good producer. Like yeah. back then, relative. I don't know because we never really we got access to data around how many units were sold. I never did the maths. I wasn't that business savvy back in those days. Huh. All I knew was that you know you had to set up the ladder to get your bonuses and um, keep your job. So yeah, we knew what what how we were doing compared to other competitors. We knew which were good prescribing areas. We didn't get down to specifics around doctors. Wow, this this is such a dangerous topic and such a very um. This could destroy my reputation, you know I this, mean, don't you? <laughs> like, I, I think the more you can destroy people that are never going to be clients, the better, as long as you're going to get cancelled. <laughs> I'm probably going to get too close to the line of being cancelled, but <laughs> as long as I can make a phone call, I can do it, have a business. So. Yep. <laughs> um, all right, so you find wine dined these famous, you know, well, good producers. Yep. And then did you suddenly have realised that this isn't fulfilling? Or what was your turning point with that one? No, I actually got sacked. <laughs> <laughs> That was, <laughs> there's been two defining moments in my life. And one of them was actually uh, way before that when I was working in a laboratory mm -hmm. doing my science, having finished my biochemistry degree and um, really not enjoying it, but loving working with people and really good at motivating people to achieve results. So we had mm -hmm. we had what we would now call scorecards where we had a big whiteboard where we were keeping track of things um, to make them perform better. And I got offered a job by another, and this was actually a, a pathology company. So I was running a pathology company laboratory. I got approached by the opposition saying, hey, come work for us in our laboratory and I went to my boss at the time and he said to me hey um, why are you going to go and do this somewhere else do you enjoy what you do I said no Jeff I don't like what I do he said well why would you go and do it for somebody else if they're paying more money he said but Deborah you don't enjoy it it's like no not really he said what do you enjoy so I love people I love talking to people I love motivating people he said well why don't you do something different um, I said I don't know what I'm going to do he said well I just don't want you to go and do the same thing again at another place just because it's more money why don't you come and join us as a sales rep or a liaison officer and so that was my first career defining moment because I was going to be um, I could have gone to another laboratory and managed their laboratory and who knows that whole sliding doors thing my life could have gone down the track of I could now be a, mm. a world-renowned pathology laboratory manager <laughs> I don't know um, anyway, that was, that was the first major defining moment. So that's what got me into sales. So he literally put his his job on the line because I was the youngest salesperson they'd ever employed. Um, and I went out there and I started selling pathology services and dealing with issues around pathology. Then I got poached by the pharmaceutical companies, more money, um, much more flash job. You just heard about all the perks that we got. And I did that for about seven years. And I was really, really good at it until I got bored. 
And then, you know, when you spend seven years waiting in hospitals, waiting in doctor's surgeries, waiting to see the person you talk to, I just couldn't stand it anymore. It's like, this is just a waste of my time. So I started finding innovative ways to actually communicate with them, get them on board with what I was doing that didn't involve literally going in and waiting for an hour in a surgery waiting room to get five minutes of a doctor's time. Mm. And um, that's not really allowed in the pharmaceutical industry. They kind of expect you to go door knocking and see eight doctors a day. And um, that was what was required of me. And I wasn't doing that. So I got caught out. And I remember going into the, the, the office for the meeting and they said, where were you on Wednesday at 2 p.m.? Blah, blah, blah. I said, I don't remember. They said, well, according to your phone records, you were here. But according to your CRM, because we had a CRM back in those days, you were at this doctor in this place. And I went, well, the phone records don't lie. Um, and I explained what I've been doing. And they went, nope, we want you to go door knocking, seeing doctors. You're fired. <laughs> mm. And I was only, I think I was 23 at the time. And I had to go back to my uh, 23, 24, maybe 24, back to my new husband. I don't know, he just recently got married and tell him that the fantastic job that flew me around the world and took us on these long weekends that were all expenses paid and had a beautiful company car and huge salary and great bonuses no longer existed. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So did I, I didn't make the choice myself per se, <laughs> uh, but it was a good choice because I was bored and so it, it forced me to do something else. Yeah, I think, yeah, there was an important lesson like, for me a while back where I thought people sell like me, which is, you know, no finesse, just work. <laughs> just like talk to 40 people. Oh, yeah. Stop yeah. 40 people a day, get rejected. And then um, there was a sales lady that was my boss came and worked with me and she was like, she stopped like 10 people, closed eight of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, but couldn't yeah. sell with me because we we're going one for one yep. where she would sell to people she'd recognize as someone that would buy because she's already done the, the time work. Yeah. Um, so it's just interesting that they stifled your creativity that could have actually been in their best interest. Could have been. And it actually it changed my career because I suddenly I realized what I was doing was a thing called marketing. And I was like, oh, marketing, that sounds like fun. And being yeah. there, I think I mean, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life when I think about it. It was like, oh, next bright, shiny object. Okay, cool. Let's go do marketing. <laughs> so I got myself a degree or diploma in marketing and um, started doing some marketing stuff. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. What, just on that, what were some of the things that you did with the, the, the psychiatrist or doctor? I had a lot of fun because I, what I found was that they were they were being visited like by two or three reps a day and they're all there talking about boring as batshit white papers and this is why our drug is more efficacious than the other drug and this is what it doesn't do and blah 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 and I thought how boring must it be to have these people coming in just to sell it you? so I actually developed um, <laughs> I had a basket full of toys and I would walk into the, the surgery and I would actually take the basket with me into the psychiatrist and I'd go take anything you want from here and in that basket there was things like there was toy cars there was toothbrushes there was I'd made a cassette tape this is how long ago it was a cassette tape of love songs so there's a cassette of love songs there was I can't remember what else there was in there but they were the kind of main ones and if they picked one of the objects first of all they got to keep it and secondly I'd tell them a bit of a story about um, you know what why that had any relation whatsoever to the drug that I was trying to sell and so the toothbrush was about um, the drug I was selling at the time it was one of the few antidepressants that didn't affect your sex life and so it was all about you know if you have <laughs> an antidepressant doesn't affect your sex life and you're going to want a toothbrush to make sure that you can actually you know um yes, <laughs> yes kiss yeah that was the PG version mate. Like, yeah. if there was complete freedom you'd go oh places. yeah i know yeah and then the same with the love song tape it was like you know so it's because it doesn't affect your sex life but in terms of motor function that was the car driving a car doesn't affect how you drive um, you know drive your car um i had something around sleep i think i had a baby's dummy i can't remember what that was for but so i just had all these different things yeah, and it just one won't kill your children. <laughs> yeah, yeah and it was just a way to kind of um, start a conversation that wasn't boring as batshit about i'm a drug rep and i'm here to sell you some drugs and here's my latest white paper and i found that they actually genuinely wanted to see me um and then i when i couldn't get in to see them i would send them things to the mail so i'd have the same kind of things but it'd be like a bit of a campaign so i'd send them a love songs mixtape that i made on my own cassette recorder and made all the printed out all the things on my um, inkjet printer and sent these things out to them um, and i also took the time to kind of get to know their receptionists and the people who managed the practice and the people who were at the um you know the psychiatry work at the hospital and just started building relationships and having fun with dealing with them rather than going around being a boring sales rep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And apparently that's called marketing. So it's like, cool, I like that. Let's yeah. give it a go. <laughs> you got that one. Well, um, yeah. I was talking to a guy the other day and he, he, record, he wanted to appeal to the NZ exporters. And so he recorded a video describing mm -hmm. what he did. But yep. then he put it on a blank 
whatever you call it, cassette. Cassette, yeah. VCR? Oh, VCR. Wow, okay. Let's, let's say, like a video thing. Video? So, the... so Betamax or VHS? Which one was he on? <laughs> it's VHS. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah Betamax was the better um, quality, but it didn't win. Wow. Yeah. Shout out. Mm. Um, <laughs> we'll go and pack that. Yep. And he just sent something like, oh, I know what you did, or yep. something like that. They catch it and just sent it to the yep. blank. Oh. And they would rush home to watch it. Without their wife being there. <laughs> yeah, all alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, just, it's interesting to see how marketing was at different points. So, yeah. was there something else interesting in the market, or like what was your first marketing thing after that? Like, did you get into it? Did you no, it? so it was really interesting. I mean, I, I, I went and did my um, marketing diploma, and I thought it's going to be really easy to find a job. I started doing my marketing diploma, and I thought, oh, well, it should be quite easy to find a job, but I realized it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it would be. So, I um, went and applied for um, basically, temporary sales and marketing assistant type roles so I had to pass typing tests now I you've seen me type I type with two fingers it's not particularly good but I'm fast because I'm fast at everything that I do so I was fast reasonably accurate pass the typing tests you know um, even though I've made loads of mistakes I was able to correct them just as quickly got um, put into a four-wheel driving firm as a sales and marketing assistant and my role was to literally data enter stuff into their database and get things sent out to them and um, because I get bored really easily I'm sitting there going this feels like a really sort of difficult way of doing this I wonder if we could do it a little bit differently and so I started developing different ways of printing our own materials in-house this is back in the days when color laser printers cost an absolute fortune mm -hmm. but I managed to convince my boss for a business case I put to him that if we actually got these color laser printers in-house we could personalize everything we sent out we could print out just what we needed to print out rather than having to send out whole catalogs that we're having printed elsewhere and it would be a more personalized message to the people and we didn't actually have a when I said there was a CRM it wasn't a CRM we would type onto let envelopes to send it out to people I said well I think we could put a CRM in because having worked for multinational pharmaceuticals I knew what CRMs were so I developed a database in access for them um, and we basically put all of our customer information in there and we actually bought a laser printer we printed everything in house and we sent out personalized things and I just changed the way they did stuff and so a few weeks into being there the sales and marketing manager quit and I went to my boss at the time Russell and said Russell I think I can do that job and he went, what makes you think you can do it? I said, you take me out for dinner and I'll tell you why I think I can do it. So he took me out for dinner. I put together a proposal, which I found the other day when I was cleaning up my house. Oh, you found a proposal. <laughs> yeah. And it was basically, here's why I think I can do it. Of course, it was an easy sell for him because when he asked me what I wanted in exchange for being a sales and marketing manager as opposed to just a sales and marketing lackey, essentially, um, all I wanted was a company car because I didn't have a company car anymore. So in exchange for a four-wheel drive company car, he got a new sales and marketing manager and I got to do the job that I wanted to do. Hmm. Wow. And yeah. worst case, you got free dinner because you said, take me out. Yeah, and that's right. You took me out for dinner. You paid for dinner. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, right. Yeah. What do I have to lose? Exactly. <laughs> well, just on that, because that, like, I think that'll be a common now. Like, um, Alex and Mosey analyzed the people that watch him and he's successful in business uh, marketing, and it's people that haven't started a business. Yeah. Are thinking about it. Okay. So, what about like communicating what you want to your boss? You know, like how do you position yourself so you can either get a raise, get an opportunity? Because you were quite conscious about that. Yeah. Um, if you I don't know. You can pass as well. No, no. I was just thinking. I I don't know that I ever was looking to um, get a pay rise or a promotion. I just always wanted to improve the way things were done. Like if I think back, all of my jobs were like, this is great, but surely we could do this better. I was always looking for better ways to do things and ways to motivate people. Because when I became the sales and marketing manager, it wasn't just about sending stuff out to, to potential clients. It was actually about managing the sales team. And it's like, so, you know, how do we make sure that they are being effective in terms of what they're doing? And I learned so many lessons in my, I've had seven years in multinational pharmaceuticals, gives you a huge understanding understanding of the really best practice way to do things mm. and so we had lots of sales training so I don't know that I ever was looking for self um, promotion it was more I want to do things better and I realized that the further you got up the food chain the, the more influence you had to make changes mm. so that's what I did well you see why it work I mean I can see why the sales thing didn't work and I can see why <laughs> the focusing on how you can improve and do things better instead of focusing on how why you deserve it yeah they're a different way to approach things yeah too. and i think that's just been a natural part of my life i don't know that i necessarily deliberately go that way it's sort of just a i'm always looking like how do i how do i make things better for people yeah well i think that's worth unpacking yeah yeah because a lot of us say it yes they want to help yep and i'm always curious as to why like what about you or your experiences in life mean you care more about others um 
gosh, I don't know, because I, I don't know that my parents were particularly that way inclined. In fact, they used to tease me because I would always be the one that rescued the bird with a broken wing or, um, you know, looked after the kid that was being bullied at school or I was always looking for the sort of the underdog and trying to make them better. And I think as I've got older, I've realised people have to want to help themselves. So I don't bother doing that anymore. I, I help people if they want to help themselves, not people who are just a, a victim, you know, um, <laughs> wanting some sympathy or wanting somebody to buy into their victim story. Um, but I just don't naturally did it. And even though I got teased for it, I just enjoyed mm. seeing that when I help people, um, you often got help back as well. Or you just, I don't know, it also feels good helping people. Yeah. I, I really enjoy helping people. It makes me feel really, really good. And so for me, it's like, actually, it gave me joy to do that. What You said something interesting there, was it the underdog? Mm -hmm. Were you ever the underdog growing up? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I got bullied a lot at school. Really? Yeah. So my mum, my mum was German. My dad was English. Uh, we were not very well off, and so we often relied upon hand-me-down clothes to get through, um, you know, get through life, I suppose. And with mum being German, the hand-me-down clothes came from my cousins in Germany. And Germans tend to wear bright colours, spots, stripes, stars, really bright colours. English people tend to wear grey, black, white, <laughs> boring, plain. Yeah. So I always kind of had the, you know, I was stuck out like a sore thumb, and also because I was particularly smart um i don't know how i think mum was pretty smart so I've, maybe i got it from her um i was also always the top of the class without even trying and so i got teased for being a girly swat for being teacher's pet for being wearing funny clothes for even having a funny accent because my my mum spoke queen's english because she was german dad spoke very um he spoke really good with good, good English, that's terrible. He spoke really well because he was actually brought up in Surrey in, in London and he was part of the Royal Air Force as well. So they were taught, you know, how to speak when you go meet the Queen and stuff like that. So well, I was always brought up to speak particularly well. Obviously, I've lost that quite a lot now since I've been in Australia and New Zealand. But, um, and a lot of the people that were, I was, I grew up in the Midlands, so they didn't speak quite the same way. They had quite a different way of talking and a different way of uh, a, a very strong Brummy accent. So I was always like the odd one out that got teased and bullied for being different because mm. mm. i have this theory yes uh that the most fulfilling thing you can do is to help a version of yourself in the world right so either the problems you've witnessed or experienced yourself yep so i'm wondering if there's if we use that as a filter, because I'm still testing it, it seems to yeah. be true. Yeah, no, I think it is true, actually. Just thinking yeah, Bob, yeah. we're on a roll. <laughs> but, but, but think about it, because if you think about the business stuff, um, the reason I get passionate about helping other business people is because I've had those... Uh, I've had their successes, but I've also had the terrible failures. Mm. And I don't want anybody to have to go through what I went through. So it's about being able to help other people to avoid those pitfalls. That is what makes me happy is to let them, hopefully, I, I think they've got to have some heartache because otherwise you don't learn. I think you learn a whole lot more from your failures, but there's levels of heartache. <laughs> and I really wish that a lot of people didn't have the levels of heartache that I went through. So if I can just you know shallow those out a wee bit, that makes me happy. Mm. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's well said. <laughs> I think just being a human is hardship, you know, like yeah. you're dying and everyone you know, you will love will die. Yes, yeah. So you can't avoid it, even yeah. if you're living a privileged life. Exactly. So on that, there was, I think, from what I've seen in myself and other business owners, they seem to have to transcend belief systems and mm -hmm. skill sets. So you came from an impoverished background, for lack of a better word. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say impoverished. That I mean, we, we had a we had a good life, but okay. it was but money was tight. That we were never living the life where everything came to you on a silver platter. Okay. But definitely not impoverished. I mean, we, there are people in the world that are de definitely impoverished. We were not that at all. We were, I would suggest. Um, Lower middle class, if we had to use um, oh, British yeah. language, in that we didn't want for anything, but at the same time, there was not plentiful money, and we, we worked really hard to get what we had. Hmm. So mid mid class. No, lower middle class. Lower Definitely middle not middle class. <laughs> middle class <yeah. laughs> okay. So how did you? Was there a transitioning moment around feeling deserving of money or success or vilifying money because? you know, these capitalistic upper class people while wow, I'm wearing my colourful dress steps from my cousin. <laughs> yeah. Was there things that you had to work through? I think I didn't do it too much later in life, but I think that I've always had an issue with money because of the way that my parents viewed it. So um, even when I had my first business and I was employing staff, my parents would always ask me, when am I going to get a real job? And they would always whinge about the capitalists and, you know, how the uh, business owners or, or, no, they talk about big, large corporations who had shareholders ripped off the people who worked for them and 
you know, they had they had this real negative opinion about business and that businesses shouldn't make money and it should all be um, distributed almost like a bit socialist if I think about it. But they weren't. They're very right wing in most of their other beliefs. <laughs> a lot of resonance there. My mum lives in a um, commune, for lack of a better word. Oh, yeah. It grows it in, this, in a trust. They grow their own food. And I lived in a happy community for like a year. Yep. And a tent. And uh, so that that is quite like the vilifying of people that are successful. Mm. What what was a turning point for you to either feel deserving of success or to vilify it less? What what changed that in your head? I don't know. There was a particular moment, or a, I can't pinpoint something. Oh, that was why it changed. I think that I learned over time um, that in order to help others, you actually need to be successful yourself. So if you want to be able to give back, there's no point in giving back if you don't have enough in your own cup or if you haven't got enough in your oxygen mask. You have that whole thing of put your oxygen mask on first before you save others. Mm. Um, and I think that I realised that often I was giving when I wasn't even giving to myself. And so therefore I would feel exhausted all the time. And though I love what I was doing, I would feel exhausted because because I had nothing left to give, but I was still giving. And so I realized that actually the best way you can help people is it's kind of like a modern day Robin Hood principle, is if you can actually make a lot of money, you can use that money to then help people who perhaps can't afford it. So there are people who can afford my services, and it's really great that they can actually do that. And same when I run the event center, we actually charge high end prices for using the event center, because what that meant was it enabled us to actually run events for people who couldn't afford that high end stuff. And it wasn't that, you know, the people who paid for it still got massive value out of it so they were happy I was happy and the people I was helping was happy so it was kind of like this change of um viewpoint is that actually when you've got uh when you've got access to funds you have the ability to do more with it there's some interesting things around the power of no and boundaries because at least the archetype <laughs> you described was I'm doing all these amazing things for others I'm depleting myself to a degree yep now it's okay for me to so how do you, if someone's like ears on the people pleasing side or wants to not offend, mm -hmm. how do you, what do you use to navigate the no or the letting people down part? So I've learned a lot of this in more recent times. I think EOS has actually helped me to kind of really solidify it as well. It's like if you're really, really clear on why you exist and what you want to do, um, then you've got then you can start to set boundaries. And you can start to say no to things because you actually have to ask the question: Does this help the needle shift? Does it help make the boat go faster? And if it doesn't, it's perfectly okay to say no. And I would struggle with that because I'm a people pleaser. Most females are, but particularly me because I like the underdog. I want to help. And so you'd you know you'd find yourself saying yes to things. It's like, actually, the, this isn't making the needle go fast. It's not about me personally, but where I want to be in the long-term future, is it helping me towards that? And if it's not, you have to go no. And then I learned that no is a complete sentence. Or if you really want to be British, no, thank you. <laughs> but you don't have to explain why you're not doing something. Uh, or you can explain it in a way you can just go, hey, no, thanks, that's not for me. Or no, thanks, that's not for me. But as soon as you start saying, I'm too busy at the moment or I've got other things on, you're giving an opening that's almost like, you know, it's like, oh, it's like men who are trying to date somebody if you don't actually say bluntly no, they'll kind of go, oh, I've got a chance, so I'm going to go. <laughs> so just being, so if you can get really clear on why you exist and what you're doing, you can you can find it easier to say no and just say, no, thank you, that's not for me. So in a way, you're making your why greater than your resistance to saying no. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. I think of um, going to France, walking on Paris, and they say those um, Eiffel Tower things. Oh, yes, yeah. And you say, no, thank no, no, and they keep coming and be like, no, I yep. don't want it. yep. But you, there's extremes as well where you say right, no too strong and aggravate a reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think something you've talked about prior is navigating uncomfortable conversations. Yes. And use toys for that too. But I what, do use toys for that too, but not what the, <laughs> what the listeners are thinking of right now. <laughs> Fluffy animal toys is what I use to help navigate those conversations. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. no relaxing drugs. No relaxing drugs. No, nothing like that. <laughs> So how do you, so let's say someone recognizes there's an issue, Yep. they need to have that conversation. Yep. How do you prepare mentally and how do you execute? So for me personally, if I know I have to have a difficult conversation, I have to write what I want to say down. Um, I've learned that if I just go in there, because I wing most things, you know me, I wing almost <laughs> everything. But if I'm having a difficult conversation, winging it does not work because all of a sudden the person I'm speaking to might get emotional or upset about it and then immediately I go straight into the, oh, it's okay, let me look after you. No, I don't I won't, I won't take any further. So by writing it down, I'm, I'm very clear on what I want to say, why I want to say it. I can actually... Um, 
clearly articulate it by writing it down and then I use that to refer back to when I'm actually having the conversation. I also always start with I'd much rather stick my head down a toilet than have this conversation, but I need to have it. And so like a little bit of humor in there around, you know, this, this is not this is not really great for me either. Mm. Um, and then when I'm working with others to facilitate those conversations, I again try and bring some fun into it. Um, don't make it too serious. Uh, try and not make it personal so that you're actually talking about the situation, which is why we have the toys, because you can talk about the elephant in the I literally use, I've got a sacred cow out there. And the other day I was working with a family business and I obviously won't mention names because this is very confidential. Um, but I had to address something that was a sacred cow in the family business. And so I literally grabbed the sacred cow and I, I held it like a child, like in front of me, like a, a protective teddy and went, you know, you can't shoot me down because I've got the sacred cow. <laughs> but I need to talk to you about the sacred cow that is happening in this room. And so by doing that, it doesn't necessarily make the conversation any easier, mm. but it does at least, it, the, the other person, and recognizes that you too are a human being you're not doing it to be nasty you're not doing it to um, you know create havoc just because you're doing it for quite a genuine reason and I suppose I can't imagine what that image of a an overweight 53 year old holding a, a sacred cow looks like but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I should imagine that when they see that they're kind of going okay this is actually a little girl you know, who's, who's, who's tackling the, the difficult conversations and I think that's where the toys can come in handy it doesn't mean that I'm not a mature adult who doesn't do it it just means that actually you're giving yourself a little bit of permission, um, permission to have what I would call almost childlike conversations because you think about children, they tend to approach things almost without a filter, don't they, when they ask questions. I'll never forget being asked by one child, you know, when's your baby due? It's like, no, I'm just fat. <laughs> it's like, so, but children don't have this filter that kind of go, you know, to, to, to not say that. And so I try to bring that childlike curiosity into what I do and I try to make sure that people understand that, you know, we're doing it from a place of, um, like a child actually wants to be loved, wants to be help, helpful, but just sometimes doesn't know how to do it. I, I can see how they would work. I was sitting with um, a clinical psychologist on the beach and they were telling me about the concept of flipping the lid, mm -hmm. where the brain actually flips the lid Yep. in a sense. So your access to logical thinking is impaired when you're in fight or flight. Yeah. So if you're diverting a person's, I guess, direction mm -hmm. with this disarming toy, yep. it helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I, I've talked about, you know, being triggered, but you have to recognize you're being triggered. Well, I've got to be very careful that, you know, you have to recognize what other people are being triggered too, and giving them that space to um, deal with that emotion because it's, it's really difficult. I mean, I'm, I think I'm quite fortunate. I've done lots of work around self awareness. Again, not perfect, but I can tell usually when I'm triggered. This morning when I came into the office, nothing was going right. And I was literally kind of stomping around. And then you can see yourself, like you lift yourself out of yourself and go, Deborah, you're stomping around. You're talking a million miles an hour. You're throwing things around the way. You've got something going on, time to deal with it. Um, but I forget that not everybody's had that training. And so for some people, they don't know that they're even in that. So I've got to be very careful when I'm facilitating that I'm I, I can't help them being triggered sometimes because just certain things will trigger us based on previous experiences based on what's gone on so it's like how do you allow them to have time to take it away from being personal and to have as you said the flip the lid give them a chance to actually um, reconvene their thoughts and I hadn't thought about it but I think the toys do help with that you know there's there's a quote um Epictetus says man doesn't suffer by a crisis but by his interpretation of it mm, yeah and I find I'm very rarely am I stressed because of anyone else. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, again, not perfect about this by any means, but the only person you can actually control or the only sort of emotions you can control are your own. You know, there's nothing worse than when you're in the middle of a fight with someone, they go, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> red rag to a bull right it's like it's the worst thing you can say um and in reality that person the only person who can um, make that person change the way they are reacting is them so conversely the only person you can change reacting is you so how you change your reaction to something can change the outcome of it there's i think there's something else interesting in the toys Oh, yes? Well, gosh, what else is there in the toys? <laughs> My mind's out of the gutter now. Just oh, good, one. good, good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you double down on what makes you you. Yep. So on that, so there will be people, corporate, got to wear this, dress this, yep. do this sort of way. Good. Just as well you're conditioned as a young lady wearing things against what everyone else thought you should. Yeah. And then your parents said you should just be this and then you didn't do I that. actually got asked to change my dress code when I was doing the first liaison sales job. They said to me that I need to go out and buy a new wardrobe. So I had that conditioning from a very, very early age that you have to do this and dress this way and this is what life expects of you. 
Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So on that, because I find the more I double down on me, yep. the, more, the stronger emotions it evokes in people that never would have got along with me. Yeah. But also Do deepens the strength of your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're listening here, haters, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can hurt haters if you just inquire as to what emotion is leading them to projecting. Mm-hmm. I've turned a lot of followers on social media just being like, what makes you think that? How do you think I do this better? And then they're like, you know what? I'm sorry. And then they start investing and helping and defending. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good, good approach. Yeah. Yeah, just sort of bring me in. <laughs> yeah, good, good. <laughs> uh, so what, what's um, – how do you rationalize that in your head on being yourself and is there a reward for being yourself or should people just get back in their little box? Oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate for not being in a little box these days, but I spent a lot of my life in a little box um, and there was lots of pressures. I mean, like from, say, being told what I should wear in my first kind of real job out in the real world, um, being told that I should do science, being told I should find a good husband, being told I should have children, all these things, that, you know, from a, and especially I think um, even when working in business, I worked in a lot of male-dominated industries, there was a, 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 an expectation of what I should be like. But I think I create a lot of it myself. So I think that once you start being told that early in your life, you start to create all these things that you should or shouldn't be. And I, I've, I've talked about this on social media. For a long, long time, I would never wear a dress. If you've met me 10, 20, no, probably more like 20 years ago, hmm. I was always in a pinstripe suit and a shirt and um, cufflinks. Or... <laughs> that was, that, shoulder pads were way before that. Yeah. <laughs> Mum was all about. Oh, see, yeah, yeah. No, that was, I'm a little bit younger than my mum. I think, I think, maybe not. Anyway, I did. I, I do remember having shoulder pads in my first kind of sales rep, so maybe not in sales rep job. No, but I mean, it was. I, I felt like I had to. So even when I wasn't in a suit, I would be in jeans and a shirt with cufflinks. It was very masculine, um, which is. And I even had really, really short hair back then too, which is kind of fascinating. So I felt. I think I felt like I had to fit in with the people around me. And what I realised. Was not only is that you not being authentic, which means that they're not seeing the true value that you bring to it, but it's also really difficult being different people that different people expect of you. So, you know, if you've got, a different, you know, I mean, Gina used a great example where you talked about the fact that, you know, you might have your friends and family and they've got this expectation of you. You might have your, your uh, sorry, your family. You might have your friends have got a different, the people you went to uni with have a different expectation. The people that you work with have a different expectation. And if you're being a different person to all those people, imagine how hard it is to manage that. Because when they all get in a room together, suddenly Deborah goes... <laughs> Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? I don't think I've had multiple personalities for years trying to please everybody and trying to fit in. And when you're actually just being authentically yourself, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to apologize for anything. If you don't like my dress, and I wear dresses now because I, I quite like dresses. Mm. Um, I bring my dogs to work because I like having my dogs around me. And people say to me, you know, well, you can't do that. It's not professional. But that's who I am. So I haven't got to pretend to try and be somebody that I'm not anymore. And that's quite freeing. <laughs> so, quite free. And also, I think oh, yeah. from a... Um, from working with me perspective, you're actually getting the full Deborah as well because I'm in my element. I'm not trying to pretend to be anybody. I'm just doing what I know that I actually do really well. And so, and I'm not worried. I mean, I, I do sometimes catch myself. Um, I work with some religious com- companies and I should be very careful. Mm. I don't want to blaspheme. I don't mean to offend, but sometimes I just, I just get it wrong. You know, I, I kind of, and, and I have to be careful with my swearing because, um, uh-huh. uh, no, no, that's not fair. I don't have to be careful with it. I try to be, um, respectful of the people that I'm working with and try really hard, but I can't help it. I'm British. Every once in a while, a fuck's going to come up because that's <laughs> that's what we do, you know. So it's, it's it's hard, but I, in general terms, I don't worry so much about it anymore. I usually kind of go, oh, oh, sorry, shouldn't have said that. Hope you don't mind. And then most people kind of go, oh, that's fine, you know. <laughs> Mum, if you listen to this, you heard it here first, swearing well, is okay. Yeah. So here's a really interesting oh, thing. Yeah, at about 40 years old, I remember I was having a really, really bad day at work and I came across this meme um, that was, it, it literally had a picture of a, a young girl with a backpack going into a wardrobe and she was saying, fuck this, I'm off to Narnia. And I thought, that's um, Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe. I love Narnia. I was like, this is hilarious. This is me. This is how I feel today. So I, I posted it on Facebook. I got an email from my father <laughs> and it said, Deborah, we cannot believe that you posted that meme on Facebook, what will our friends think of us? How you know? How can you use that language in a public environment where people can see it? Um, you know, we're really disappointed and we can't believe that you've done this, and we can't believe what our friends will think. And I, I sat there and I kind of went, "Oh my gosh, I've upset my dad." And then I thought about it, and I, she wrote back and said, "Dad, fuck off." Oh. <laughs> Thirty years <laughs> old. I did not actually swear in my in my thing. If you notice, I used a meme. I did not actually swear myself. I said I thought it was funny. Here's the reason why I thought it was funny. Basically, fuck off. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started going, <laughs> and like, I was forty, and my father was delivering. Was not forty? Yeah, I mean, that sums it up. Yeah. Right? So there's a few things in there around femininity and masculinity. Yes. And you know, we don't necessarily have to go patriarchy route, but is there a place for femininity in business, and how is it supported and nourished in the sense that? Do you double down on a certain way or as you can't generic it? So I've got really strong opinions on this and I know a lot of people don't believe, um, don't necessarily uh, agree with me, but I actually, th I think you should be able to be feminine. I think that's absolutely fine. I wish I'd known that earlier because I would have been much happier kind of wearing dresses and being quite feminine. Um, but I don't like fighting um, for feminine feminism. Uh, you know, I'm a feminist in, in deep down in my sort of beliefs, but I don't believe in fighting and trying to sort of put people down or trying to... Uh, um, aggressively challenge them on their behaviours because I actually think that that then puts them in a defensive position mm -hmm. and so they're not likely to listen. So when I was on the, I was on Women on Boards for a long time and we would publish, um, we publish certain papers that showed that actually females were better at being directors, companies that had female directors did better in business and we'd share all this information but a lot of it became a little bit man bashing for me mm. and I was like oh you know I'd much rather we talk about the po so that's that's the positive stuff the positive stuff is women actually help put boards perform better mm -hmm. boards with women on them have companies that perform better but they were talking about things that you know um, it, I don't know I can't remember exact examples but I, I always sort of said to them I'd much rather we focus on the positive stuff rather than sort of man bashed because I think if you're it's like when you say calm down the last thing you're going to do is calm down so if I say to you you know um, you shouldn't be doing this and you're going to get sort of triggered by that so when I used to work in very male-dominated environments, I'd do it kind of subtly and with a bit of fun. And I did it in a way that hopefully it didn't really offend people, but I made it pretty clear. So um, I talked about this on a, on a video the other day. It's like, actually, I remember being in my first board meeting, and I was the GM at the company or well, part of the senior leadership team, whatever it was. And I remember going into the board meeting, and they literally said, oh, good, you're here. You can take the notes. Um, and, and by the way, the coffee's over there. Could you pour us a coffee? And so I kind of went, you know what? I will pour you a coffee and I will take the notes. But just to be really clear, these are tasks that we can all do. So how about I do it this time and next time maybe you could do it right? And so it was always about, um, you know, don't let – I could have gone in and gone, I'm a female. You're just picking on me because I'm a female. Why should I have to do the notes? But it's like, well, okay, I don't mind doing it. But let's just be really clear. Next time round, um, somebody else can do it. <laughs> hmm. And that was always my approach is kind of trying to do it in a way – um, I, I think I, I used to, when I used to work in the engineering industry, I actually had to go out into the warehouse and I'd sit and have, I don't drink beer, but I'd sit and have a wine with the boys while they're drinking beer. And initially they were kind of like, oh, you know, what are you doing out here? It's like, well, I'll just come out and have a chat. Oh, well, this is kind of blokes here. It's like, well, I'm just really one of the blokes. And I would actually just try and, and um, they would say, oh, well, you know, don't look at the naked girls on the wall. It's like, I don't care about the naked girls on the wall. And I genuinely don't. I think they're trying to say to people, oh, take the naked picture of the girls down. It's part of who they were. I didn't, it didn't worry me. Um, I'd much rather that they were themselves as well. So why would I go on about me being authentic and me being who I am and then be telling other people what they can and can't do? So I don't know. I'm a, I'm a feminist and so I believe that there should be equality in terms of if you're doing the same job, why wouldn't you get the same pay? Um, I do believe that it's nice to have a door open for me though at the same time by a man. So I've, I've got these real mixed feelings and I certainly don't believe in shooting people down. Is it the saying... Um in a military sense, it's the longest way around is the shortest way home. Yeah, okay, I like that. Because, like, in World War One, they would just dig a hole and go straight. Yeah. So that led to a lot of casualties. And same thing with um, how to win friends and influence people. It's like mm. there's no right or wrong in an argument. There's only someone that feels wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, good, good point. Yeah. See, I often don't know the theory behind these things, but I just do them intuitively because I kind of go, actually, I, I know what works. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, yeah. yeah, well, was useful. <laughs> yeah. Instead of being theory based. Yeah. Um, okay, so there was there was a, an accolade as well where you're like youngest GM for intercity bus or something. Yeah, you yeah. Had like <laughs> a, a lot of people that you're looking out for, and then most of them men. Yes, yeah. So we had about 220 staff, a lot of bus drivers, obviously, because Intercity is the national coach network over here. Um, so we had we had some we had some females in the call centre, um, but generally the operations side of it was pretty much men, and also the board was 
or yeah, the board was all men. So uh, the chairman of the board was a male, all the board directors were males, the CEOs, no, they're not. <laughs> but they, again, it's like that they, they hadn't been, um, I, I'm very fortunate, I've done a lot of work in sales and marketing, they hadn't been exposed to sales and marketing the way that I had, and they hadn't been exposed to the way that I like to motivate and inspire people too. So yeah, it was, it was a big job for a young female. The interview was fascinating because I got interviewed first of all by just the CEO, then I had the chairman of the board and one of the directors come in and one of the questions they actually asked me was have you ever fired somebody and it's like I had so I had to explain you know what I did and how we'd done it and it's like wow okay this is good. this is interesting <laughs> I'm being asked in my interview I've ever fired people I think they've got some some plans around you know restructuring whatever it might be um but yeah it was a it was a great job it taught me so much about you know dealing with some very set in stone ways of doing things and how you, you had to work with people to change their opinions of things. So, you know, they didn't believe there was any merit in having a consistent brand. They weren't sure that it was a good idea to change bus drivers' uniforms or change the the the, the, the messaging on their buses. There was all kind of things that I tackled with them um, that we actually made some significant changes that turned that business around from being flatlining to actually back to growth. And we even won a contact centre award um, for the top contact centre in New Zealand against the likes of the other travel players so in New Zealand, um, Qantas, um, some big players out there. So we, we did a good job, but it took gentle, I would say, um, is the saying an iron fist and a velvet glove? Hmm. I think that's probably what I am. Is I'm actually, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid to have the difficult comes. I'm not afraid to tackle things, but I've learned to pick the battles and do it in a way that the people think it's their own idea rather than forcing it. Because back at the council, I was considered a bulldozer, and that's when I used to go and just kind of go, "We're going to get shit done. We need to get stuff done." They go, "Slow down, you know, stop bulldozing people." Well, I can't stand not getting things done. So by the time I got to the city, which is my next job, I, I kind of learned that actually bring people on the journey. Um, let them think that they well, let, let them have some input into it so it actually is their idea as opposed to just forcing things council, that stuff. Is 18 there... months of my life worst 18 months of my life <laughs> yeah what, what do you just on that on that system side of things what leads to a culture where mediocrity is accepted um, I think it's when you actually allow people to do things. So if you think about often in family businesses, you might have a family member who just has the job because they're a family member. And if they don't do what's expected of them in that job, you're basically setting the bar, right? The bar is down here, which means other people will actually do it. I had a, a situation at one of my businesses that I was working at where we had somebody who was blatantly kind of disobeying the rules and pushing the boundaries and um, they were letting them get away with it. So if you let them get away with it, what does that say to everybody else that's the bar mm. yeah so I don't know I believe that's a little bit of it and then it's also around um, a lot of people particularly entrepreneurial businesses the founder has got the idea of the vision really strong in their mind they know what they want to achieve but they haven't managed to communicate that with the rest of the team so people don't understand how what they do fits into the bigger picture so if you haven't shared that and they don't understand how they fit in then they just become workers worker bees i suppose they're just doing what they're told as opposed to actually buying into what you're trying to achieve so i think two things you get the vision in place and you really clearly articulate you have people understand how their role fits into that vision mm -hmm. then you have to hold them accountable discipline and accountability so you actually get the traction to achieve it and you've got to have um, you know, guidelines and people have to follow those guidelines. You can't let anybody get away with not doing it. You've got to walk the talk at the top and you've got to make sure every person on every level is actually following what we've set out as our guidelines and we call them core values or the measurables, whatever it might be that we're doing. Yeah. That's Otherwise, a, people are just workers. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. I, I think in theory, like people crave it in the sense that it's something they know. Like, so I'm used to me doing things and not outsourcing to others and trusting in them. And because I've been so obsessively a technician for so long, I might have a competency that's, you know, higher than them initially. Yep. But because they do it all the time, then they're the ones that become exceptional. Mm -hmm. So on that, so the transition from, I don't know where the pain comes. Is it like at 15 employees? Is it the first one man band? When does it start becoming like, uh oh, systems? I think it happens when you start to get 
um, I don't want to call them levels because I don't like the, the whole idea of hierarchy per se, but when you start to get, you know, sort of a leadership or a management team and then people who are working um, under those various functions in the business, you get a bit of complexity there. Um, suddenly it is not as simple as, well, Ryan started the business, he told us what to do, everybody knows how to do it. You actually start to, you need to have um, some structure around that to make sure that it's actually delivered consistently. Mm. And, yeah, so it's probably probably early, it's probably early enough when you're at three to five people to start thinking thinking about it but certainly once you get to that 10 to 15 mark you've really got to have proper systems proper processes ways of keeping people on track ways of the, the way of your way of doing things um otherwise the wheels start falling off because yeah. you can train two or three people you can work with four or five people once you get more than that it's it's becomes difficult yeah it's going to get interesting if i ever get to that point <laughs> you'll get there <laughs> i've done the um I've done the train 15 salespeople and then train leaders to lead part. Oh, yeah. And they told me the system. All right. But never made the system. And then <laughs> just it'll, it'll be interesting when it gets there. Yep. Um, okay. Well, we've done a, a solid a solid stint there. Yeah. 53 um, minutes. Woo. How long? 53 minutes. 53. 54 oh, now. Yeah. My back is starting to hurt. So I was like, fuck, I close to an hour. But it, it's been, that's the thing. Like, I didn't know a lot of these stories. And yeah. when people have the opportunity to understand sort of who you are, where you came from, and that you earned the way you view the world. Yep. So on that, whether it's someone that, Speak okay. Let's speak to young Deborah listening. Oh, you got something. I just wanted to say. I mean, that's that's been my history when I was working for other people, and I think that has you know made me understand better how to run business by running businesses for other people. I got to learn a lot about how to run business, and then of course having my own business is a completely different kettle of fish. Because even when you're a general manager in an organisation or even a paid CEO, you still don't. You're normally in a company that's well funded that doesn't have to worry about paying payroll every single week. Doesn't have to worry about um, people following the right persistent processes i know there's a, there's a different level of accountability when it's actually your own business so even if it's a big established business you've still always got that sort of feeling of that weight on your shoulders when you're working for somebody i don't know that you have quite that same understanding so even the transition from managing somebody else's business to managing your own business can be a big one mm yeah that's so exciting yeah. like, <laughs> oh i love it i mean it's been a, I, I've, I've loved all the successes and all the failures because i think that both have taught me different things um you know i've I, I know how to turn a business around and and get growth back again that's been what i've done in all of my em employed life i've done it with startups on myself um but i've hit hurdles and hit the ceiling if you like and failed so i also know that everybody hits the ceiling at some point and can't get past it and if you don't surround yourself with the right people and get the right help you will go down <laughs> so let's say let's say there's this business recession coming yep. things you know got to lay off all these people i'm at the moment deborah's talking about what 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 do you do as someone that's by their side because you seem emotionally invested in the outcome and i think that's probably a yep. testament to the value that you bring because you care yes what do you do like and you're balancing caring and doing what's needed <laughs> yes <laughs> so yep. what do you okay shit hits a fan deborah hey my business fucked what are we doing <laughs> yeah. so i mean hopefully when i work with people we we always i ask them to prepare for the worst case scenario as well as the best case scenario so i reckon having a plan b is essential in any business at any stage think about what is the worst thing that could happen to your business and what would you do if it happened now you might kind of go but that's negative thinking that's not going to help me get to where i'm going we've got the plan to get to it i've got the 10-year target we've got our one-year goals but we actually have to think about what the worst thing is as well and by having that plan b it means that when something happens because it will happen something will happen to your business at some point i guarantee it um whether it be a recession that you can't control whether it be you lose your major client i mean that i can go through the whole all the scenarios i've been through <laughs> something will happen where you'll suddenly have to change the way that you're doing things if you've already worked through a plan b and gone worst case scenario what will happen what can i get rid of in terms of expenses where could i get new business from what would the structure need to look like to actually manage this how am i going to cope with the fact that i have you know at the event center uh $24,000 of rent every month that had to be paid whether we were operating or not. If you know that and you kind of go, so I've got that, what do I do? Can I sublease the space? Can I, you know, so think about all the different possibilities. You can then put that plan away in the drawer 
and you may never have to use it. Nah, that's not true. You'll definitely have to use it at some point, but you've kind of got it covered. So then when you actually hit the, the tough times or the ma loss of a major client or, or something happens, you've already thought it through because like you said, in the fight or flight mode, when you're there and something happens, you lose that major client in the US who was 80% of your income and you haven't got a plan B. So first of all, you go straight into flight, fight or flight mode. You'll be triggered. You'll be kind of panicking. You'll be trying to make decisions in this absolute panic state. If you've got a plan B, once you've taken a few breaths, calmed down, taken a clarity break, you then go back to your plan and go, that's right, I've already thought about this. I've already thought about what I need to do. So now I can logically start working through that and go, okay, so what are these things do I need to do? I did it just recently. I, we are going to go into a recession. I'm kind of going, if we go into a recession, well, we will do. Um, oh, yeah, okay. well, well, I think we, are, we will. We, we'll do, a recession is a downturn in the economic um, market. We're already in that, right? How big the recession will be, I don't know. But I've already, actually already gone through and gone, okay, so what does that look like? If this happens worst case scenario what are the things i would have to do to actually change to get through it because the worst the, the best lesson i learned was when i didn't have that plan b that's when you start you get emotionally attached to the business you start to make decisions that aren't the best decisions you get yourself into an absolute blind panic you're stressed you make the worst possible decisions but then knowing i've got a plan b now it's put away i don't intend to ever use it but it's there so if i need to i can you know once i've got over the initial sh um, shock or stress i can go right okay what do i need to do now and i've got that nice well thought through plan <laughs> probably similar to the military they drill it yeah Till you know what to do when you without thinking. Yeah, emergency. Well, it's called civil, civil defense. Yeah, what do you do in an emergency? If you know what to do, you could. It, your Wait. what is it called? It, it kicks in that you just automatically. Yeah, that's the one. The rats. So, the, so you just you go. Okay, cool. I've got that sorted. I know how to do it. Um, so I'm not saying you should focus on the negative, but if you know what the negative looks like, you focus on the positive. But if a curveball comes, you kind of go, okay, got it. So people listening to this that might want to start thinking in and yep. prepare. Yep. Where do they find you? How do they find you? <laughs> well, all this experience. I'm not so good at selling myself, <laughs> as you well know, which is why you came in to help me. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I've got a very unique name, Deborah Chantry Taylor, D E B R A, Chantry Taylor. Um, nobody else in the world has that name, so I'm absolutely <laughs> one of a kind. Now, in the past, I'd be picked on and bullied for that. Now I'm going, yeah, you're one of a kind, isn't it amazing? I'm different to everybody else. Um, but also, if you just go Deborah, D E B R A, dot coach, that actually shows you all the things that I'm involved in. So, the podcasts that we do, the newsletters that we have, the books we've written, all that kind of stuff, everything is there all in one place, I hope. That's what I tell people anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah the yeah. website's stuffed let us know yeah and then also people I, I you know email wise um <laughs> i've got the longest email in the world i think but if you just go deborah i've got the, the one the eos worldwide is deborah dot chantry hyphen taylor at eos worldwide.com but if you just go deborah at business action dot co dot nz that will also work <laughs> well, um, yeah well thank you for letting me come on your podcast oh thank you for running my podcast <laughs> <for me. laughs> that was that was quite fun thank yeah. you yeah okay, yeah cool. Well cool. Done. thanks very much Ryan. <laughs>